I'm Zachary Vernon, head of hardware at Xanadu. Today, I'll be telling you about our efforts towards scaling photonic quantum computers. Let me start with a brief overview of what I'll be speaking to you today. I'll begin with a roadmap, looking back at uh, what products we currently have available on offer, on our, especially on our, our cloud deployed hardware, and also what products we'll be uh, launching in the near coming months and, and, and years. I'll then move on to QPU performance and applications. Last year at Q2B, we actually announced for the first time our cloud deployed photonic quantum computer, the world's first cloud deployed photonic quantum computer. Um, now we're ready to tell you about some of the results, both at the component level and also the application level, about how that system has been performing. I'll then move on to something very exciting. It's our architecture for achieving fault tolerance. This is something that we've been working toward for a while. And recently we made public our blueprint toward a fault tolerant architecture based on squeezing based photonics. So I'll tell you about that. And then I'll finish up by telling you a bit more about how you might work with us. So a reminder of who we are, Xanadu is a photonic quantum computing company and we're full stack. What that means is we work on both software and hardware. Our software offerings really center on our Xanadu quantum cloud. This is how you access our hardware with Strawberry Fields, a library for programming photonic quantum computers, and Penny Lane. Penny Lane is actually a hardware agnostic platform for quantum computing. I'll tell you a bit more about that toward the end of my talk. Our hardware you can, can broadly be split into kind of two tracks. We have our near-term devices, and these are our X-series chips and other chips coming soon available on our quantum cloud. And then there's our push toward fault-tolerant quantum computing. This is a long-term effort really to advance the frontier of error correction and fault tolerance within our photonic domain. So Q2B is really the place where, you know, it's, it's good to see how progress is going and, uh, and, and look back over the past year. Um, so just to highlight the major milestones we've hit here, particularly on the hardware side and the architecture side. If you look at our cloud offering, uh, last year we had one quantum machine online and available for access. We now have three chugging away. They've served over the past year over a billion shots. So that's a billion quantum circuits loaded and executed on our machine. And we're also been onboarding quite a number of users. In fact, we're now, I believe, the first, um, uh, the first photonic quantum computing company to actually uh, get revenue uh, generated from, from cloud deployed chips, something we're quite proud of. In terms of hardware upgrades, what are these chips? Well, we have our X8 system running. That's what we announced last year. But since then, we've also brought online our X12 and X24 systems. That's the number of qubits. And we have a 40 qubit chip actually currently being fabricated. We expect that to be delivered by the end of the year. We've also unlocked uh, a considerable advantage, uh, uh, advance rather, in, um, in the connectivity that's available on our X series chips. Next year, we'll be rolling out our XD series, which has 100% connectivity. And that really came down to some advances in the uh, qubit generation technology, our squeezed light sources on chip. And as I mentioned, we actually went public and posted on the archive our blueprint for fault tolerance. This is how we will implement error correction, scale up to millions of qubits, and ultimately achieve fault tolerance in our squeezing-based architecture. So let's look at our roadmap, see uh, sort of what we have available right now and what's coming uh, soon in the near future. Currently, as I mentioned, we've got three chips, X8, X12, and X24. This X series is our first architecture that we've come out with. The, the number there uh, refers to the number of qubits. As I mentioned, we've got X40 on the way. That chip is under fabrication. And we'll be continuing to scale this, roughly doubling every six months to a year in terms of the number of qubits to get to X80 to around X100 level in the coming, uh, coming year or so. We also have our XD series. This is the 100% connectivity chips, allowing users to embed really arbitrary data, something very exciting. The X series chips, while quite useful, do have a restriction in, in the uh, sort of class of graphs and graph class of data that can be embedded in them. The XD series will completely lift that. And that, again, really comes back to some very uh, major advancements in our squeezer technology, our, our qubit sort generation sort of components on our chips based on something called nanophotonic molecules. So we'll be starting with a, a small chip, like, likely XD4, and then continuing to scale that up as we have with the X series. I won't say too much about our TD series. TD stands for time domain multiplexing, except for that it's, it really is the way to get to thousands or even millions of independent quantum systems, so different qubits that can all be independently addressed and entangled. We'll be coming out with some machines uh, that are cloud accessible based on that architecture coming soon for, for users to play with. I should mention that all of these tracks sort of have a greater purpose. They are useful for sort of the near-term era, and that's why we're developing, but they also have this greater purpose as they all converge to give us fault tolerance. The, the technology and hardware that we have to develop in advance on all these different products, in fact, is exactly the same that we, uh, technology that we do need um, to uh, implement error correction. So the, the fault tolerant architecture that I'll be talking about actually is based on the convergence of the three technologies that went into these three product lines, the X series, XD series, and TD series. Meanwhile, we'll continue to sort of make those separate technologies available on their own to users over the next couple of years. 
So I think we've been pretty vocal about uh, why we believe photonics is the platform of choice for quantum computing. Just to recap some of those points, one comes back to room temperature operation. While it's true that we do have some cryogenics, particularly for the detection system, the actual quantum processing units, right? The actual quantum magic happens at room temperature. Our chips do operate at room temperature. That makes it much easier to uh, develop our technology. We don't have to mess around with cryostats, but it also allows us to imagine a much broader deployment context one day where you don't need to have these things sitting in a lab where you really can have them ultimately one day in people's homes. Small form factor, that's also related. Photonics is compatible with a truly board scale uh, one day um, sort of uh, uh, device. And of course it's lower cost. We enjoy a great synergy with, um, you know, the, the the big uh, optical telecommunication industry that's already invested billions into the tools that we need. So we don't have to reinvent a lot of wheels like the laser and fiber optic components. Um, we can already take advantage of that. Scalability and modularity, that really is connected to network compatibility. We can interconnect our chips very easily using fiber optic, the same fiber optics that's carrying this talk to your home right now. And because our, our information is already encoded uh, sort of in the optical domain, that's trivial. You just connect a fiber optic cable to our chips and that's a big uh, barrier and hurdle that the other approaches um, have to have to cross. It's very difficult to communicate uh, information between, not let alone two different quantum computing machines, just two different chips within the same quantum computer. Quite a large challenge, whereas for us, that's, uh, that's relatively straightforward. Okay, so let's dive in a bit further into our X series. This is a picture of our X8 chip. Our X8 chip is the one that's been going for the longest time. And its job, roughly speaking, is to take classical stuff in, you know, Electronic, uh, electronic voltages, which uh, sort of encode the quantum program compiled from the user, and a laser, a classical laser pulse, and turn that into a programmable entangled quantum state. That's accomplished by using squeeze light sources. These are our qubit generation components and a programmable interferometer. That's a sequence of gates that the user programs. After that entangled programmable quantum system is, is synthesized, it flows off the chip and is detected by photon detectors. These count the number of photons in each output and it's in the statistics of the different photon counts at these detectors that the results of the computation is ultimately encoded and from which it's extracted. So let's dive into some, some uh, sort of performance now. Um, as I mentioned last year, we announced this chip and we've had a, a lot of time both in, internally at Xanadu and also in collaboration with our users to test the performance. So here I've shown sort of the results of a, a simple quantum circuit that's designed to see how well we can programmably entangle separate components, separate qubits on the same chip. What we do is we dial in a simple circuit, we turn on pairs of our squeezer sources, our qubit sources, and then interact them. But before we interact them, we essentially change the relative phase that they experience. And so what we're looking for here is the ability to stably, repeatably, and programmably entangle the different qubit sources, right? That's one of the most important features of a quantum computer that makes it useful is the ability not just to create qubits, but to interact them in a reliable way. And so what you're really looking here on all these six plots, these six plots being the different sort of possible permutations of picking a pair from, uh, from six qubits or from, uh, from four qubit sources. And we're looking for these uh, oscillations to be pronounced, to be large. The amplitude of the oscillations effectively tells us that we are stably and programmably entangling these systems. This squeezer technology was characterized in a report of it uh, came out in Science Advances. Uh, this is a high impact journal and in fact made the cover of Science Advances. So I just highlight that to give you a flavor of the sort of cutting edge that we're working on within nanophotonics. And as you can see here, these oscillations are quite stable and it does really show that at the component level, we can make our qubits talk to each other. One of the basic, uh, really basic building blocks of, of building a quantum computer that's required. So moving a little bit closer to real applications here, um, we wanna kind of do a systems level test. This previous slide really showed a component level test, but we wanna see how the system behaves when all the devices are being used. So all the different components, all the squeezers and all the gates. So what these plots show is kind of the results of a randomized benchmark called within the paradigm of what's called Gaussian boson sample. Effectively, we dial in a random gate sequence and it's random in order to not bias it toward any particularly easy or particularly difficult types of problems. And we turn on all the squeezers and measure the probability distribution of the output. And then we compare it to theory, we compare it to the predicted distribution based on a theoretical model of the device. And what we're really looking for here is agreement between theory and experiment to see whether our device is behaving as our model expects. And as you can see, there is very good quantitative and quantita qualitative agreement between experiment and theory here. So this really tells us that at a sort of unbiased, randomized way, our device is behaving as expected. And that's a really good indicator that when applied to you know, non-random problems, that it will continue to perform so. So flying uh, a bit closer to the sun now in terms of real applications, uh, what we wanted to look at was a chemistry problem. 
Um, so we actually have a, a very interesting problem that can only be encoded in our chips, in our chip architecture, and that's a vibronic spectrum. That's a bit different than maybe the, the sort of quantum chemistry that most people are used to hearing about, which normally relates to the electronic structure. This problem is a bit different. It's related to computing the spectrum of a molecule as it undergoes an electronic transition, transition that leads to structural changes in its vibrational modes. And in fact, this problem is very, very naturally embedded in our X architecture and our XD architecture. It's not accessible to the other quantum computers on the market today. Superconducting and ion trap based approaches actually can't encode this problem very well in the near term. So it's something that's quite unique to our chip architecture. And that's really comes down to our using photonics and more specifically our using a squeezing based photonic architecture. So what we did here was dial in a couple of sort of toy model molecules, small scale, and looked at the, exp the experimental distribution, what the chip actually generated in terms of its output to statistics. And then again, compared that to a theoretical model of what we should be getting if we understand our chip correctly. And as you can see, again, very good uh, qualitative and quantitative agreement between the sort of output distribution, the output uh, vibronic spectrum of these encoded sort of uh, uh, toy, toy model molecules. So this is a small scale problem, obviously, right? It's, it's too small to claim any you know, real advantage here, but it's a really good indication that this architecture does work and provided we can keep the performance high, as we scale up the system, it will become useful for real world problems on molecules where this is actually um, uh, you know, a useful calculation to perform. And again, this is quite unique to ours. Another really cool application that's unique to uh, sort of our chip architecture is graph similarity. It turns out you can encode graph, graph structure data. So that's data structured as a bunch of nodes and edges and weights associated with those edges. You can encode problems like that very naturally in the different properties, the different phases in our chip. So what we've done here is then a graph similarity problem. We've encoded four different types of graphs that are sort of structurally distinguished from each other. They have different numbers of negative weighted edges. That's the sort of highlighted, uh, highlighted lines in these different uh, diagrams of these graphs. And what we've done is by looking at a feature vector, a feature vector composed of different sort of probabilities of click patterns, three-dimensional, of uh, corresponding from the output distribution when each of these different graphs is encoded, you can actually tell that they naturally cluster. So the readout statistics classify the different types of graphs. Each point in each of these clusters corresponds to just permuting the different uh, vertices of the graph while keeping its overall structure the same. In this case, the number of negative weighted edges. As you can see, the machine can very well distinguish that two different classes of graphs are different from each other, but it can also tell you that a graph is similar to another if it has the same overall structure. And that's visible from this very significant and distinct clustering behavior. So this is actually really exciting. It's the first time anything like this has ever been done on any quantum computer, let alone a photonic one. And again, it's, it's a problem that's really naturally encoded in the X and, X and XD series of chips and is not something that's really accessible to other quantum computing hardware right now. So I emphasize again, the sort of unique nature of the types of problems that can be addressed with these chips uh, based on our squeezing uh, based approach. So let's move on to the grand vision now. I've been talking about this for a little while, our blueprint for fault tolerance. Uh, this year, actually quite recently, our architecture team uh, finally came out with our sort of, uh, our, our roadmap toward achieving error correction, implementing error correction and achieving fault tolerance. So you can, you can read more about it on the archive for the technically minded, I certainly, encourage you to have a look and, and see for yourself. This is based on a very different type of qubit called a GKP qubit. Uh, GKP qubits themselves have, as an idea at least, have been around for a while. That stands for Gottesman, Kataev, and Presko after their sort of inventors. But they have not yet been taken up into a serious architecture for quantum computing. So uh, it turns out that our chips, our X series chips, well, I say it turns out, but it's not a coincidence. Our X8 series of chips are really pretty much the same type of chip that's needed in order to synthesize a GKP qubit. So if you have a high performance X8 chip, then it turns out that you can synthesize a GKP qubit. The catch is these GKP qubits aren't generated all the time. There's a sort of non-determinacy. There's a probabilistic uh, uh, process. And so you don't get them all the time. You press a button, you send a laser pulse into an X8 chip, and only a fraction of the time will you actually get a GKP qubit. So, you know, you need to boost that probability and you can do things like multiplexing to get around that, and we will. But the problem is it's very hard to get to sort of 99% or 100% probability of generation, even with multiplexing. So you need a way of dealing with the fact that sometimes the GKP qubits will not succeed. The GKP qubit sources, rather, will fail to fire. So our architecture team has developed a scheme in which you can swap out these failed nodes for ordinary squeeze states. And ordinary squeeze states are, are quite, quite, uh, quite straightforward to generate in our architecture. We're, we're experts at doing so on chip. And crucially, that process is deterministic. You get one whenever you want one. 
So you knit together this universal resource state by generating most of the time GKP qubits, but in case you don't generate one, you can always swap in a squeeze state. And you have this sort of hybrid 3D cluster state composed of GKP qubits and squeeze states. And then all the computation is measurement-based, implemented by a very benign processor, which I'll tell you a bit more about. GKP qubits are sort of you know, special. They're not like a typical qubit in that they have some innate robustness to, uh, to noise. So that's why we're really interested in using this. This is a, a very novel and very new architecture. that has a lot of different advantages compared to other architectures for scaling up to millions of qubits and implementing error correction to achieve fault tolerance. So to tell you a few, uh, a few more points about these advantages, um, you know, why is this architecture uh, sort of advantageous above competing architectures? One is that it's scalable to millions of, millions of qubits, and that really comes back to the squeezing-based uh, photonic approach. It's the only architecture that's actually demonstrated the scalability to millions of entangled quantum systems. You know, blueprints exist. People are just talking about how to get to thousands in other architectures, and, and we'll likely get there. But there's only one architecture that's actually proven its capability. There are a number of academic groups around the world that have shown gate sequences implemented on tens of thousands to millions of entangled quantum systems, and that's really only been done using photonics, but more specifically using squeezing-based photonics. So that's a big advantage. It really is a, a sort of a, a important, uh, important indicator that this architecture is much more scalable than others. The other one is, is really relates to um, you know, the room temperature nature of, of our system. Um, and this is actually an even stronger claim than with our near-term devices. And that's because the error correction in our scheme occurs at room temperature. Error correction generally requires feed forward. That means you need to measure some quantum stuff use the results of that measurement to do some classical calculation and then feed that forward back into the quantum domain to do some more, some more gates to correct the errors that are detected. Having that done at cryogenic temperatures is a really big hurdle and it's led a bunch of you know, competing approaches to have to think about things like cryogenic CMOS, chips all the way down in the cryostat that to do that classical digital computation in between or alternately to try to you know, solve this problem of getting all those signals out of the cryostat. Very, very challenging. For us, everything happens at room temperature in the actual computation. All the error correction is implemented by a very sort of standard, class, almost classical chip based on room temperature ordinary photodiodes. We don't even need superconducting detectors here. And the sort of intermediate step is done by a you know, digital classical logic microprocessor that can sit right on the same board or in fact, right on top in kind of a flip chip way of the QPO, of the photonic QPO. So that's a real distinguishing feature that, that, uh, that makes it uh, very promising for implementing error correction. And then, as I mentioned, GKP qubits themselves are kind of special. They have an intrinsic resistance to noise and optical losses. That's our equivalent of decoherence. So if you have some noise on a GKP qubit, it already is more robust to, uh, to resisting that, uh, that kind of noise. And that leads to lower thresholds, generally lower overhead in terms of the number of physical qubits needed for each logical qubit. And that leads to a better path and a more optimistic case towards scaling up and for achieving fault tolerance. Okay, so I just about out of time, so I'll wrap up. I wanted to leave everyone with a, a few ways to sort of work with us if you're interested. If you're interested in hearing more about our research, um, have a look at our research page on our website. If you're interested in programming photonic quantum computers, the world's first cloud deployed photonic quantum computers, again, have a look at our access, uh, at our website and uh, you can request access. And then there's Penny Lane. Penny Lane is actually an open source uh, a software package that you can contribute to. So I'll tell you a bit more about that. Uh, PennyLane is, is a, it's a, quantum, it's a library for, for doing quantum computing. It's an open source library for doing so. It's for, for programming quantum computers. And it's actually a, a kind of a pioneering effort to make a hardware agnostic platform to do so with a specialization or focus, I should say, on quantum machine learning and quantum chemistry. But it is quite general. Again, it's hardware agnostic, so it does not depend or does not require our hardware. It connects to uh, all the compute major approaches, both in trapped ions, superconducting qubit hardware backends, and also the major leading simulators and popular SDKs. It's really emerged as the premier um, quantum computing uh, software platform. As you can see, thousands of new users every month are downloading this, and it is open source and free, so you're free to use it. You're also free to contribute to it um, as a collaborative effort. So check out the pennylane.ai website if that interests you, I certainly encourage you to do so. If you're interested in working with us, we're always hiring. We have a number of full-time positions and also internships always coming up. Uh, we're over 60 people now. We're one of, I think, really the best companies in the world to work for in terms of deep technology. Um, people, the brightest minds from all around the world, all the best inst institutions, really is a wonderful place to work. So I will finish up with a beautiful shot of what it looks like in our labs that's at the top floor of a office tower right in the core of uh, downtown Toronto where we have our offices and labs. 
Thanks very much for your attention. I'm certainly happy to take uh, any questions.